Thanks for having me. Uh, Tim Sweeney really started the conversation, and I bet I think most everybody was here. I was here this morning, basically saying that uh, beyond, uh, beyond VR as we know it today, there is this opportunity for a metaverse, some sort of a uh, large shared space which embraces person-to-person uh, -person interaction and creativity. And so that's fundamentally what I've been working on my whole uh, working life, uh, starting with Second Life and now with High Fidelity. And so I'll just try to talk about like more and different things uh, than Tim did and kind of take it a step beyond. That is, uh, what are we really talking about kind of when we're not talking about uh, video games and the things that we're uh, doing with VR uh, with the amazing touch controller and the vibe you know, that we can do right now? What are, we, what are we talking about beyond that? Well, the first thing I'll say is that VR is a uh, disruptive medium. And what that means is that it is, it, what that means is that if you think you understand it today, if you think you kind of know what we're going to be doing with VR, that's a lot like saying you understood the internet in 1994. I was there, it made my career, the internet, the fact that you could send packets from any computer to any other computer. I definitely felt like I understood what it meant, but I didn't. Uh, I thought that it was a giant, uh, sort of a library, uh, you know, and a, a store of some kind that we were going to build, and that in and of itself was amazing. But I didn't really completely understand uh, the potential associated with, with what the internet would become. As, as Jason was just saying, I, I, didn't, I couldn't even begin to imagine, you know, even something like eBay, you know, in, in 1994. Um, so VR is the same thing. And in fact, in comparing VR, as a disruptor, you really, I think, as many others have here, have to compare it to the smartphone and the internet. And there are a lot of different comparisons to be made between both. Fundamentally, around open ecosystems, as, as Tim said, I hope and I believe, and we're working toward making it kind of more like the internet than the smartphone. But it's a disruptor, and disruptors always take advantage of changes in communication technology. It's not so much computer technology. It's how computers connect us as human beings for the purpose of being uh, communicative uh, and creative and, and you know, making things and being in places. The big reason, and I'm going to kind of skip past this and talk more about the impact, but the big point here, and with the touch controllers coming out, like today, right, uh, and, the, and the games for them out on Oculus a couple days ago, really, really underscores this point. The, the big reason that VR is so profoundly disruptive the first of these reasons is this concept of the interface itself with the computer. If you're wearing a headset and you're holding two hand controllers, you have 18 degrees of continuous freedom of motion, six in each hand and six in your head. And that, those 18 degrees of freedom not only allow you to manipulate things, but, but also communicate. But if you think about manipulation, I love that Etch-a-Sketch idea. You know, it's, it's hard to draw, except for kids, for five minutes. In one, with one degree of freedom, and with two degrees of freedom, it's really hard to make things in 3D. So when you make the jump from two degrees to 18 degrees of freedom, it means that we're fundamentally, suddenly, finally, going to have a way to build and manipulate things and, and do sort of physical things that we normally expect to be able to do in the real world inside the computer. We have never had that capability before. And that, the hand controllers, the tracking, is what makes VR fundamentally disruptive. And as I said, this impacts not just uh, interaction, building, manipulation, you know, which we've all been able to start trying with the best of, say, the video games that we've been able to use with the Vive and the, and the Touch. But the other thing, and it's a thing that we really don't even fully scientifically kind of understand how it works, is the way that uh, being immersed with the head and the hands and being able to move your hands if the software and the hardware is written the right way, which is what we're working on, enables face-to-face -face communication. And that is the thing that is totally mind-blowing. We have video conferencing. It doesn't work. We don't use it. We don't like using it. It's, a, it's an unfortunate thing that we fall back on. But, uh, and Tim mentioned this earlier today, uh, what happens if we can use the Oculus Rift and the Vive to teleport ourselves to another point in space and be standing in front of someone and shake their hand and look in their eyes, maybe even give them a hug? You know, we don't know what exactly that means in terms of the technology and the rendering of that. But uh, what if we can suddenly do that and it's just like being there, except you can't smell people and you can't touch them? 
What if that happens? The impacts of that are profound, and I'll talk more about that. But taken together, it does suggest, as many others have seen, that we are almost certainly going to see one of these hockey stick style adoption curves associated with VR, which looks a lot like these other disruptive trends. I think, uh, I, I believe it was, uh, 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 I think it was, uh, uh, was somebody, somebody was saying earlier that the adoption curve is probably a little longer than this. It was Joe from Google was saying that the adoption curve is a little longer than the smartphone. I think that's true. But whether it's 10 years uh, or 12 years or 8 years, I think it's very likely that because of that interactivity, because of that ability to interact and communicate inside the machine, we are at the beginning of a curve that will take us to worldwide daily use, just like with a smartphone. That is to say, billions of people uh, using these devices. And now what I'm going to do, don't run it yet, um, is uh, this, this is a video which shows you High Fidelity, my project, which is about where we are today in terms of the actual experience of two people standing together in a virtual space, wearing uh, an Oculus Rift and a Vive, communicating with each other. And let me show you what that feels like. Do you guys roll that or do I click the button? There's a video here. Do I have to click? Tell me to. Oh, wait. Nope. Go back. Can you guys do that? Click on the video? We checked it earlier. Anyone? Anyone? You guys got it? Oh, there you go. Right? Do it again. Oh. No video, Peter? Well, this is always the answer to the age old debate of whether to have your computer at the back or the front of the room when you make a presentation. Well, I will, uh, well, let me move on. I'll, I'll, let, me speak, let me speak to what's in this image. If we get it working, it's fine. But um, what you're seeing here is two photorealistic people. Um, they were captured using a device that takes a single picture of a person with about 100 cameras at the same time. What you can't see until, you, until the video rolls is that the two people are uh, basically able to animate and stand next to each other, grab something like the whiteboard marker the guy's holding in his right hand, communicate with their lips moving, look at each other, uh, use their hands for body language in this room completely naturally. Um, it, it works surprisingly well. The experience of doing it is arresting face to face. You can do it using High Fidelity's beta today, so you don't need to use this video, especially with the touch coming out with an Oculus Touch, uh, with the touch or with the Vive, you can do exactly what you see in this image. Uh, What's remarkable about the world around these people, and again, is kind of where we are with the state of the art, and Tim touched on some of this as well, is that the physics and the experience, the programmability and the plasticity of the con... Oh, wait a minute. Something happened there. There's no sound, but this gives you an idea. My hands. And I'm Caitlin with an HTC Vive Pre and hand controllers. And we wanted to show you really quickly with these hand controllers how we could both play a quick game of tic-tac-toe on our whiteboard here. Uh, I'm sort of jumping ahead. Oh, I see. <laughs> I didn't win there. But anyway, you get the idea. Awesome. Thank you. So, so that's, I mean, that's like where we are today right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's up and running. Um, there, there are people standing in the world uh, of high fidelity with whom you can do that right now if you had our stuff downloaded. Uh, the room that they're in is, as I, as I was starting to say, it's physically real. You can take the books off the shelf there and throw them outside if you want to. They're writing on the whiteboard using the whiteboard itself is built uh, in JavaScript. Again, as Tim said this morning, our belief is that this must be 
uh, an open system, ideally all of it open protocols, probably most or all of the software open source, and just generally available for uh, everyone to inspect and use and deploy in a way that is fundamentally decentralized like the internet itself. If we're going to reach uh, that kind of level of scale, we're going to have to do it in exactly the way uh, that Tim talked about this morning. Education. Right now, tactically, there are these devices available. Jason was talking about people, whether they go to the Best Buy or not and buy them. Let me tell you the reason why people are going to go to Best Buy and buy the Oculus Rift. One of the reasons outside of entertainment and gaming that I want to put out there for you to think about right now. The experience you just saw in that video will enable a kid to put one of these headsets on and instantaneously be in a classroom with other kids, with their teacher staring them right in the face, asking them questions. That classroom can be a magic classroom like this one, where they're actually inside a living cell. But the most important thing is that the normal process of education can go on, just as it has for the last you know, 500 years, with teachers and students sitting together face to face in a space able to interact. Now think about that for a second. If we're able, using VR to create educational spaces that are this good, and that are exactly the same as going to school, doesn't it mean, and, and, and if the price of entry to that is to get a kid a, a $500 Oculus headset, doesn't that mean that we're about to see radical things happen just there, just in education? And that, I think, is one of the very first example. Beyond entertainment, though, there's other things, just meeting new people, dating, meeting them, going to events where you, you meet people you didn't know before. By the way, one of the interesting things about the early years of the metaverse, the early days of this kind of a phenomena, is that most people don't know each other because uh, the purchase of these devices will be slow. It's going to be a J-curve. And at the outset, it's going to be an incredibly diffuse bunch of people all over the world, all different ages, backgrounds all hanging out together. And so the applications that will win will be the applications that enable them to do something like learning together, like meeting each other, like just exploring crazy stuff, the same way we did on the internet in the, in the mid-90s. But the, but the, 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 the last uh, thing that I want to talk about is kind of where does this go from there? So looking at kind of. That, that education idea, you know, 10 people in a room together as the starting point, where do we go from there? Well, a lot of you may recognize this uh, as a screenshot from Grand Theft Auto. Now, Grand Theft Auto, for those of you who have tried it, which I bet is most people here, is just so beautiful and arrest, it's just so incredible in its, in its presentation of a virtual world. It's, it's unbelievable. You know, you've got this Los Angeles sized region that you can fly around in, and everything down to the rocks on the ground is incredibly detailed. You can just fly, you know, in, you literally fly in an airplane like that one, go from any point to another and drop in and, and see this unbelievable level of surface detail. In many ways, it's what I've been dreaming about my whole life, is, is just continuing to push toward that. But the thing that doesn't work with Grand Theft Auto is that, if, as you probably know, if you move a rock or entice a cow to walk over to one side of a field or something and then drive around the block and come back, everything resets to the way it was before. But that's all about to change. The visual quality here is the visual quality that we can generate in a VR environment. But if we use a connected metaverse of server machines to simulate this space, the space itself, even using the desktop machines we have today, broadband connected at home, if we used all our machines that we have at home today, like the machines V was talking about, to simulate, to run something like high fidelity on them and simulate a connected metaverse like this, the size of that space at present is the land area of the surface of Earth. All of it can be simulated on the machines we have today with enough concurrent access for everybody in the world at the same time. And that situation will double in land mass every two years, just as Moore's Law tells us it will. So if you look a little bit beyond this first application for VR, look at what's going to happen next. You've got to understand how strange things are going to be and that we are about to enter into a time when we will be able to create places that are as detailed and real and organic and compelling as the surface of Earth, only many, many times larger. And that's just, you know, the next 10 years or so. So let me wrap up there and questions, and thank you very much. A couple of questions. Hi. Um, you talked a bit about communicating with other uh, humans. 
What about communicating with uh, some non-player characters? Uh, do you see a, a space in the metaverse for some AI? Is it going to be represented as people, or is, are we going to try yeah. to differentiate them? So AI in the metaverse, uh, big, big initiative announced yesterday, I think, called uh, the Open AI Universe, right, which was kind of a, a place where the bots will learn about us. I think that's fantastic, if that was kind of the, the pitch on it. I actually think that's a very real uh, future. I think what we're going to see with respect to AI is many, many sort of bots NPCs, non-player characters that are present and persistent in these virtual worlds and perhaps even learning as they stay inside them. As humans, like everything else we've learned with VR, naturalistic interactions rule the day. And so we're going to want to interact with AIs as human beings, as people, and VR is going to be the place that allows us to do that. That's a great one. Last question before we hand over. Thanks. Hi. Um, you draw an interesting distinction here with Grand Theft Auto resetting every time someone, you know, you walk around the block. Um, but it then leads to the question of if we have a large shared environment, um, you know, there will always be trolls who look to, to wreck your pristine garden or whatever else you make. How do you see um, public access to the metaverse yep. contrast against... Uh, keeping things persistent as people have worked to create them? So that's a great question. So if, if this world can be written on and graffitied and modified and edited per, a lot more easily than the real world, how do we keep that from being madness in terms of something we all actually want to be a part of? I'll skip to the end. It's, it, it's a whole field of research. It's, it's a big part of what we think about and work on. Um, fundamentally, we have to have uh, a reasonable guarantee of anonymity and access to virtual worlds with respect to our identity. But I think what we will probably end up with is a kind of systems of physics and some sort of like reputation currencies that allow us to sort of grant people the ability to edit the world or our part of the world depending on something that we have collectively uh, come to know or said about them. That is, I think some kind of digital reputation or digital trace about you will set uh, how we allow people to do things, and it's a great question because that's one of the really big uh, how the heck is that going to work problems right now of, of these worlds. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you.